There's probably two things which struck me a little bit um, in, uh, in, in speaking to victims. The first is that um, people who are coming from DPRK uh, exhibit the fact that the DPRK as a country is so uh, uh, isolated uh, and also the system is so extreme. Um, the system of governance in the DPRK. Um, I can't remember any other places where, for example, individuals have so little knowledge of, of human rights, what it means to, to have human rights and what it means to be able to complain, what it means to be able to, to, to challenge state power. Um, even in some of the most repressive places I've worked, there's still knowledge, yeah? The other thing that's a bit peculiar is the long-standing impact uh, and nature of some of the violations, or many of the violations. You know, we, we have violations documented going back 70 years, yeah? Um, and what you come across is people who are still fighting for justice for those violations. It's the fact that the victims, which in this case are the families, are still fighting after decades and decades, which you know, strikes me profoundly. It's enormously concerning. As I said, bad things happen when there is no transparency. Uh, we're very concerned that uh, those two phenomena the, the, the closure plus the promulgation of these, of these laws uh, suggest that there is, that beyond any public health reasons, there is a desire to, to, to reassert more control in the country. And the only thing we've got to go on is past experience, what's happened in the past when control is reasserted, and that generally involves very, very serious widespread violations of, of human rights. What sorts of accountability are possible? All are possible. Um, for me, the question is more how to move forward. Those options were set out in detail by the Commission of Inquiry years ago. Um, that includes prosecutions at the national level in DPRK. That's where it should happen, but that's not what's going to happen. Uh, other options are put like universal jurisdiction where other countries can, can prosecute or, 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 or local jurisdictions such as here in the Republic of Korea has, has the option. And then of course there's the ICC. The thing to remember about the ICC is that it, is, it was created as a court of last resort. It's not as though cases are supposed to go automatically to the ICC. They're only supposed to go there where at the national level there's a, there's, there's an, there's a, there's a lack of willingness or ability to, to prosecute the most serious crimes. Um, the High Commission of Human Rights has consistently called for a referral of the situation in DPRK to the ICC. It's a matter for the Security Council at the moment. It hasn't been referred. Uh, I wouldn't say that's, that won't happen in the future, but at the moment we can't focus on that. The other form of accountability we talk about is non-judicial accountability, which is things like truth-telling and memorialization, uh, reparations, for example, you know, civil liability, you know, monetary reparations, um, guarantees of non-recurrence. Non this is the understanding of accountability that we have in the international community these days and that we can move ahead on. Ultimately, the shift has been towards victim-centred approaches, meaning that you ask the victim what they want. Yeah, you don't just treat them as a passive uh, victim, but you, you ask them what they want. And many victims, for example, on enforced disappearances, what they want is they want the truth. They want to know where their loved one, uh, what happened to them when they died in particular. Um, so accountability in that form we can move we are moving ahead on and I see
in the next in the coming years we will see more and more progress on that form of accountability. Resolutions of UN political bodies are incredibly important. They mightn't seem so, they might seem routine or even, even boring to some or out of touch, but they are incredibly important. I mean, routine suggests that they're just adopted without people paying much attention in a sort of automatic way. Um, uh, I can assure you that's not the case. Uh, each resolution stands on its own as an expression of the will of the international community at that point in time. It's, it's not the case that it's just tabled and adopted again just on the basis of what happened last year. There's a, there's a, there's a review of the situation each time. The fact that there have been resolutions adopted by consensus year after year for 18 years makes it stronger every year, the fact that this is the consensus position of the international community. When faced with a body of 18 adopted resolutions, uh, there's a much stronger united position of the United Nations members than otherwise in a one-off resolution or something. Um, but for me, that's the ultimate expression of international, of the will of the international community. The overarching one for us is the Universal Declaration of the Human Rights 75 years, uh, which we've started that campaign. Um, we hope to uh, leverage because, you know, the, the, the anniversary of the Universal Declaration more or less, or the life of the Universal Declaration more or less tracks the whole story of DPRK. And because I think the UDHR was born out of the Second World War, uh, and because the situation here in the Peninsula is still ongoing since essentially the Second World War. It's a key opportunity for us just to, to say, OK, everyone just pause and let's think about the way forward. In terms of specific thematic issues, we will focus, we have a major report on enforced disappearance coming out. Uh, we are working on uh, forced issues of forced labour. Um, we are uh, continuing to focus on accountability. Uh, we have uh, a series of consultations with stakeholders. When I say stakeholders, that includes victims. As I said before, a victim-centered approach meaning, means listening to victims. So we will be giving a lot of focus to the voice of victims next year uh, to hear what they want. And the reason it's important to do this advocacy is because the world is the world's attention is being dragged to many other things these days. Uh, and the trick will be to be able to maintain that when there is a peace and security crisis, when there is another 50 missiles launched to maintain the focus and say, yes, there's peace and security, but there's also human rights. That will be the challenge uh, next year. Mm -hmm.